If you have your Bible and you'd like to follow along with me this morning, we're going to be continuing our journey back in Romans. We're picking up with Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. So if you want to grab your Bible or open an app and start making your way there, that's where we will be. And it is good to be back. I can promise you I am pleased and blessed to be back. And uh, this was the right text, I think, to come back to. And the right text that God needed to speak to me in, and so I think it's going to be the right text for the church this morning. Let's read God's Word together from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering, in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now, the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit who lives in you. Would you guys bow your head and pray with me? Lord, we have before us a profound and powerful passage of your word, a difficult passage. I suspect, God, there are things in here we want to hear and we will be encouraged by. Lord, there are also things in here that are hard to hear. And while it is edifying and good for us to hear your words, some of these things may be, for some of us, correction or training or rebuke. Lord, I'm, I'm asking, please, like a loving father who, who corrects and, and brings along his children, Lord, bring us along in this. But Lord, I'm also begging that you would encourage us. And I suspect, maybe like me this morning, there are some in here that need this encouragement. And they need this reminder. And they need to know, Lord, that you have set us free from the, the clutches of sin and the death sentence that comes by it. So, Lord, please open our eyes this morning to see like we've never seen before. We're asking that, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate this text. God, help me to preach it correctly and right and true and straight and with great clarity. Lord, let us be transformed by it. It's in Jesus' name I I beg and, and praise and say all these things. Amen. Well, this verse, Romans 8.1, it's a significant verse in my life. Uh, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the very first verse I memorized when I became a new believer. Uh, that happened when I was in college. I was an adult. I went back to school a little bit later. It had been a few years. My wife and I were married. And so this verse has great significance. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I encourage you to memorize the verse. It's a helpful verse. Maybe it's helping some of you this morning. Maybe it's something that you might need to remind yourself of often. But I beg you, please, please, please do not make the same mistake that I made as that new believer. You see, I simply lifted this verse right up out of its context. I'd heard it. I thought it was great, uh, but I didn't read the rest of the paragraph, let alone 
Paul's argument that this all sits in and why Paul would say this and what it would be there for. I had no idea. So while it was a good reminder there was no condemnation, I didn't know any of the meaning. And when you don't have the meaning, you just sort of naturally import your own meaning. I put my own meaning into the text. I, I sort of came up with what it really meant when people would ask me or when I'd think about it. And you know what happens when you do that? The verse becomes full of my words instead of God's words. Now the verse has no power because only God's words have power. My words have no power. I mean none. Zero. I can't even get an order right at a fast food restaurant with my words. No power, therefore no help. So if we want God's help, we need to understand what God is saying in his word. Now don't get me wrong. I still understood the main point. The main point is that sin has no hold on the Christian. Sin has no hold on you and me if we're Christians. The problem is I didn't get there with the right reasoning. The, the understanding of why it meant that was wrong. And so, therefore, I lived exactly opposite of what the text said. And I thought exactly opposite of what God would want me to think. And so, therefore, I had it all backwards. And so, I was sort of submitting to the world, the flesh, my ways, instead of submitting myself to God's word and surrendering myself to what he would have so that my mind would be transformed and renewed to his mind so that then I could discern the good and pleasing and perfect will of God, Romans 12, 2. So I was just making it up as I was going. Here's what I used to think this scripture was teaching. This is, this is how I used to understand it. I used to think without reading the rest of it, I used to think that this was saying that Jesus came, and praise the Lord he did, that's great, to take away the punishment of sin, so I wouldn't have to face that, to take away the law, so the law wouldn't be significant anymore, so the Old Testament would have no hold on anything anymore, we really wouldn't have a lot of significance, and so that I could live free in Jesus. Man, I could not have been more wrong. And all we have to do is read what's here to realize that is not what this verse is saying at all. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to be encouraged by this verse. I want us to understand the verse. So I want us to, to take a really in-depth, close look at what it actually means. The flow of Paul's argument, the words he's using, why he would use those words, not other words. I want us to see what's here really up close. Okay, so we're going to look at this from that vantage point. I went to Oregon this last month, me and my family, during the sabbatical. It was great. We were in southern Oregon, so the beaches there are not made of sand. They're made of, like, rock, like lava rock, and rock that hurts you if you take your shoes off and try to walk barefoot in it. In fact, we got down on these beaches, and there was tide pools, which has little creatures crawling around in it, and, and really cool, like driftwood, and all sorts of neat things, but it really caught my attention when I looked close. And my eyes are going bad as I get older, so I had to look extra close. There's little pebbles in the waves. The waves are almost like sandpaper. There's little rocks moving along in the waves, up the beach, and down the beach, and then over here, and over here, and those pebbles are just grinding away at the stones. They're shaping the beach. But you, you look really close and you can just see how that's working, how the power of the waves and the rocks are, are forming this thing. So that's the up-close look. But then we'd also get up on these really high vantage points because the highway, the 101, like goes all up and you can get really high and you get out on this point that like you're just thinking, you know what needs to go right here is a lighthouse. And you're standing on the point and you can look, I don't know, 100 miles that way and 100 miles this way and a million miles that way. <laughs> You have this giant shoreline and this powerful ocean and all those rocks and the water and, the, and it's beautiful. And you realize it was shaped by all those little stones moving around from the up close. So you have two vantage points. So what I'd like to do for us is I'd like to see the first vantage point, the rocks moving around in the water. It'll get really up close in the text. And then I'd like us to pull back so we can see how this text shapes the shoreline of all of Scripture and the Christian life. So that's our two vantage points. Up close, really close, and way back up really high. Now, I'm going to spend the bulk of my time in the first vantage point. Okay, This isn't going to be a 50-50 on, on time split. So if 
you're starting to get nervous and you're checking your watch, don't panic. We got to get right down in close for a little longer than it's going to take to see it up high. Okay? So let's go ahead and take a, a really up close look at the passage of scripture we have here. Sorry. You know what I got to stop doing? Wearing staticky sweatshirts. Let's see if I can tuck this in to my belt so it doesn't touch that. Hey, Sound Booth crew, who we love, you guys are great. Anytime you hear that, because I can't hear the speakers as well, I, I kind of saw you back there. That'll be, give me the symbol. Just start flapping your arms. Okay. Is that better? Great. Okay. Where were we? Deep dive. Close look. Let's take a look. Romans 8, 1. I'm going to start with the first verse, and then we'll, we'll work through it. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and in the English, it starts with the word, therefore. Therefore, as we've seen in Paul's argument, leads us back to realize this is coming out of something he's already said. And in this particular case, this therefore points us all the way back to his discussion on sin, on the fall, on the sin nature, on how that impacts our mind and our worldview and our thinking and the consequences of sin and death, all the way back from Romans 1, picking up speed at Romans 3, really ripping along through 6 and 7 until it culminates right here in verses uh, 24 and 25 of the previous chapter, 7, 24, 25, you just hear Paul's heart come screaming out from this argument. What a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this body of death? And that's the question when we examine our sin. When we examine the fallen world, when we examine a debased mind, when we examine all that's in rejection to God, when we see our own life in light of God's law, who will Save me from this body of death. I know I can't do it. In fact, it looks impossible for anyone to do it. It's the question for the Christian, isn't it? Oh, wretched man that I am, woman that you might be, who will save me from this body of death? But he goes on, and it's because of Jesus. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. But because of Jesus there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. But see, the, the interesting thing about this sentence is in the English, it starts with the word therefore. And the word therefore is in there in the Greek. But in the Greek, it doesn't start with that word. See, Greek works a little differently than English in that word order isn't really very important. You put case endings and things on the words, and you can mix and match them. You know what they do in the sentence. It's very helpful, very efficient. So one of the things that they do in Greek, because word order is not important, is they can, if the writer wants to create an emphasis, he can move a word to the front of the sentence. He can front load it so it catches your attention. It's the first thing you read. In, in English, it would be like bolding something and then underlining it, and you gets your attention. Now, you can't do this very often because if you did that all the time, it'd just be annoying. But if you do it once in a while, whoa, it's attention grabbing. And guess what? That technique is employed right here in Romans 8.1. You know what word is at the front of this sentence? Oides. And that might not mean much to you, but this may. It means none. Nada. No. No condemnation. Condemnation? No! Hey, how much condemnation? None! It's the important, bolded, underlined word. None. No. And then, if that wasn't enough to get the reader's attention, something else happens here. There's no verb in this clause in the Greek. Okay, that might not be that big a deal. Whatever. We speak in weird, incomplete sentences all the time, but the verbs are the backbone of the Greek language. They'll drop nouns, just imply a noun. But a verb, it's critical. And yet this sentence has no verb. That's to catch the Greek reader's attention, which is why I'm telling you. So it's like this statement of fact that basically says, no condemnation for those in Christ. I mean, it's punchy, it's pointed, 
If you were reading along and the natural hearer of this first letter from Paul would hear that, they wouldn't miss it. It's attention-grabbing. It's shocking. No condemnation for those in Christ. What does it mean by condemnation? Even that word is attention-grabbing in this verse. That word is used only four places in the Bible. Three of them are right here in Romans, in this context. One of them is also used by Paul in one of his other letters in the exact same context. Well, so normally you get to the word condemnation, and you have a word that would be like a court proceeding or a judicial process or a, a hearing. That word is crisis, or, or it could also be crema. There's two different words that kind of mean that, the courts, the, the process. That's not what he uses here. He uses the word katakrima, attention-grabbing. What? It's a more of a holistic word that not only means the process, it not only means justice, it not only means the judge offering his judgment, but it also means the entire sentence and the entire punishment waiting to be carried out. It's holistic and complete. It's not just the judgment, it's the death sentence. This is the condemnation that's discussed here. It's like a condemned building. It's got the sign on it, the placard. Condemned. Don't enter. Dangerous. This building is of no value, no use. And in only a matter of time, the explosives will go off and this building will be dropped to rubble. Condemned. That's the word that Paul uses here. And how much of that is there? None. None of that. None. Yet, we need to recognize that what he's talking about is not just the process. It's the death sentence. So now, in light of this close look at this sentence, let's look at how the rest of this plays out. Let's take a look. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who who are in Christ Jesus. Because, verse 2, everything in the rest of this paragraph is actually building out and completing what we just heard in the first sentence, the shocking statement. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You know, I want, to, I want to hit pause for a second. It's been a while since we've been in the book, right? You guys are probably coming off of the parables and thinking about that. I'm going to come back to this. I want to get the big argument so we see exactly where this fits in context. Okay, so let's remember, at the beginning of the book, we learned that because of Adam's sin, all have a sin nature, because of the fall, all of us have a sin problem. We're born in sin. We like to sin. We love sin. All we want to do all the time is sin. We have a huge problem. We're sinning against our holy God. He makes that argument in Romans 1 through 5. And then we learn that that sin leads to total death. Spiritual death, physical death, death of the planet we live on, death of all things, corruption. That's the consequence of the fall and even our sin. Okay, and that's uh, Romans 6 and 7. But now where are we at in the story? Where are we at in the argument? 8-1. Huh. Death is everywhere. We're sinners. But there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, it's going to continue, and I think this is the, the view we need to see. Why is there no condemnation? Because God condemned sin through Jesus Christ who was the perfect sacrifice. That's going to be verses 2 through 4. But we find this is only available to those who are in Christ. And it's evident who is in Christ by their mindset. It's verses 5 through 9. And then if you're in Christ, you will escape the final death sentence and be raised to life with Christ. That's from verses 10 and 11. And then I want to give an entire Sunday to the 
kind of the conclusion. It's not the total conclusion, but the concluding idea of this, and that is that if you are in Christ and there's no condemnation on you, you are adopted as sons and daughters of God, and sin no longer has any hold on you. So his argument here is that sin has no hold on us. Okay, so now that you have that perspective, let's jump back into this. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. He's not talking about the law of Moses when he says the law of sin and death. How do you know, Pastor Brian? Well, because I know that God gave the law. I know the law is holy. I know the law is perfect. And I know that Paul added a qualifier, this sin and death line. So he's making a reference here to the ramifications of what we're facing under the law. The law is perfect, but he's talking about the inevitable, unavoidable consequences that will be our death. Jesus has set us free from that. Now, it's a play on words because in the next verse, verse 3, he's going to talk about the law Again, and now he is talking about the law of Moses. What the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. What could the law not do? Because it was weakened by the flesh. It couldn't save us. You know why? Because it started with corrupt administrators. Those priests, those prophets, and all the people who were to obey the law, every single person that were to live this law and also become priests of the whole world and tell everyone were already corrupt. They already had a death sentence. The starting spot was already in failure. It was weakened by the flesh. It was weakened by us. While it was perfect from God, we corrupted the law, and it has, it has zero ability to save us says what the law couldn't do, though, praise the Lord, God did. Okay, what did God do? What did he do? Let's read. What the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He, God, condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. Think book of Leviticus, think the tabernacle, sin offering. He sent him as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but who walk according to the Spirit. God took a people who were condemned by our sin under the perfect law, and he provided a perfect substitute. He took our sin, he put it on that perfect substitute, Jesus Christ, And he ran it through the process of the law to condemn sin. He condemned the thing that was causing our condemnation. He did it all in his perfect justice. And some of you might say, well, hold on a second. What? Why did he have to do it that way? Well, he couldn't change the law. That would not make him just. So he kept the perfect law. He didn't didn't change the law. Instead, he condemned sin. Now, others will say, wait a minute, why why didn't he just take the sin off of us? Here's this sin. I'm going to take it off, and I'm going to move it over here, and I'm just going to condemn this. Some of you might be asking that. Why why would he have to put that on Jesus? Well, here's why. Because what he took off of us wasn't a physical, tangible thing. He took off a pronouncement. He took off a violation. Our sin is like a sign that said we violated the law. It's not a thing. It's an action. And it cannot be separated from the one who commits the action. Okay? There's a murderer. The murderer killed a bunch of people. We can't go, I'm going to take murderer off this guy and put it over here, now he's okay. No, it's a statement. He's a murderer. It's a definition. It's a description. Sin is a description of us, but it was not a description of Jesus. Jesus was perfect. 
He lived the law perfectly. So God took the description sin, lawbreaker, off of us. But he had to put it somewhere. Now you're the lawbreaker, Jesus. Now you're the sinner. He made he who knew no sin to be sin. But now we still have to have a trial. The law still must prevail. So he ran this sinner, Jesus, who never committed his own sin, but took the blame for ours through the gauntlet of the perfect law in order to kill the condemnation, the declaration of our sin. Does that make sense? That's why you can't hate the sin but love the sinner. Because it can't be separated. It doesn't work that way. Justice was fulfilled, and our sin condemnation was put on Jesus the substitute. Unlike how I understood the verse when I first learned it, I've come to realize Jesus didn't come to ignore the law. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. Jesus didn't come to turn a blind eye. That's not what he did. He came to go through it, to fulfill it, to take the weight of it, to do it. And his sin, our sin, let's remember that, our sin that he took on himself, he took the punishment in perpetuity forever. It's paid for forever. At least it's paid for for those who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. I'm not being a meanie here. That's what it says. Okay, it's not automatic for everyone. It's not universal. He didn't come and take it, your sin against your wishes uh, and did all this stuff. Salvation is for those in the Spirit. And that's where Paul goes next in Romans 8, 5 through 11. Man, i got to pick up the pace. I told you not to panic, but you can panic now. <laughs> Let's do this so we can understand the distinction between the lines. Let's read through verses 5, 11, and then I'm going to come back and comment. Uh, com- you yeah, just comment on them. So let's read these together. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now, the mindset, how's that for a word play? Now, the mindset of the flesh is death. But the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, It is unable to do so. Those who are not in the flesh cannot please God. Excuse me, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, praise the Lord, you, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit who lives in you. Okay, there are two groups. There's no middle ground. You're in the flesh or you're in the Spirit. He starts with those who are in the flesh. He's saying with their mindset on the flesh, they're in the flesh. They're in the flesh. That's a critical statement. Okay, they've set their minds on themselves, on the world, on their desires, on the things of this life that they don't fulfill and don't satisfy. They're in the flesh. Okay, and it's a, it's a picture of unforgiven, unpaid for sin. It's a picture of the condemned building that's still standing in the flesh. Okay, and it says they're hostile to God. And they can't please God. That's hard to hear. Because I see people doing good out there. That guy's doing good, right? He's pleasing God. This says no. No. And you say, how can that be? Okay, I want you to imagine the biggest football fan you've ever known or could ever even dream of. No, no, no. Not a football fan. Not a fan of the sport of football, but actually a fan of a team that plays football. They are a fan of the team. They got the shirt. 
They got the jacket. They got the hat. They got the watch. They got the license plate thing. They got the stickers. They got pants. They got underwear. They got socks. They got shoes that are all branded with that team stuff, right? They got a Bible the same color of the team. They bleed the same color of that team. Like they are all, they are the team's super fan. They pay to be a part of the fan club. They, all of it. That team can do no wrong. You know some of these people, right? That team and that person's, they're perfect. They're great. Okay, so now you got that person in your mind. Someone on the opposing team, coach, player, does something good. In fact, someone on the opposing team does something amazing. It's incredible. Yet the super fan says, nope, not good to me. Why? Because the people on the opposing team are wearing the wrong jersey. It's like that, and it's so much more when it comes to how much God loves God's team. You don't have the right jersey on? Nothing you can do can please God. It says they can't submit to God. They are unable to do so. They are incapable. So even if it looks good to us, it's still being done with a rebellious heart, with the wrong jersey. Romans 7 and 8 says the mindset on the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. This is why the sinner cannot clean himself up enough. This is why the sinner cannot do enough good. This is why it doesn't matter if I'm a good person. There's nothing you can do. And even if the person could, God's word says the person won't. God's word says it's not going to happen. That it would please God if the person were to say, you know, I've decided today I'm going to switch jerseys. I'm going to go from the flesh to life, and we're going to go ahead and do this. Right? It says it can't happen. The Bible elsewhere calls this blindness. The person is blind person is deaf, can't see what God is doing. It's like Balaam and the donkey in Numbers 22, verses 21 through 34. You can, you can read that later, but I'm going to tell you the story. Balaam is a priest, and he's hired by the enemies of God to go and put a curse on God's people, and God doesn't want that to happen. And so God sends an angel with a sword to get in the way, right? But only the donkey can see it. She's the only one that's got eyes to see it. Balaam, the priest, can't see it. They're walking along the trail. All of a sudden, there's a giant angel. I don't know. It doesn't say if it's big or small, but it has a sword. It's going to cut them down. It's going to kill Balaam. The donkey's like, bah! And so off the trail, the donkey goes. Balaam gets mad. She, I think I said he, she. The donkey's a female, by the way. Off she goes. Balaam gets mad. Wax her with a stick. What are you doing? doesn't understand the circumstances. But donkey comes back up on the trail. Donkey keeps going. Another angel shows up. Well, same angel, sword, same situation, except now there's a rock wall on both sides. She's like, Balaam, you're going to get whacked by a sword. She's pushing over. The donkey's pushing over up against the rock fence, crushes Balaam's foot. Balaam's like, you stupid donkey. Wax her with a stick. Can't see the situation. Keeps going some more. Now, the angel with the sword shows up in a narrow spot. There's no getting around. Donkey's like throwing in the towel. I'm done. I'm just going to lay down right here. We're not moving. I'm not going to that angel with the sword. The donkey lays down. Balaam gets furious. Just starts whacking the donkey. Just pew, pew, pew. So God opens up the donkey's mouth. So the donkey can speak to Balaam. Surprise. They have a conversation. Donkey's like, what are you doing? Donkey's trying to reason with, convince Balaam there's not a problem. But you know what Balaam says? If I had a sword right now, I would kill you. So now God intervenes and he opens up Balaam's eyes. There's an angel with a sword. New facts, new perspective, new vision. And what was Balaam's response now? It says he fell down and worshipped. It says he repented. It says he asked for forgiveness. 
And then when he went to go do the task, he only did what God did, and he surrendered himself to God. Why did he do that? Because his eyes were opened to see. And given the circumstances, the most logical thing he could do in that case is surrender to God. He was blind. Now he sees. Cam Huxford said, The blind won't gain their sight by opening their eyes. God opens our eyes. Maybe God's opening your eyes. Maybe you're seeing sin differently for the first time. Maybe there's something going on you're saying, oh no. Maybe you see Jesus differently for the first time. Maybe you've heard it a hundred times, but for some reason now you hear it. Maybe you've seen it and read it a hundred times, but now you see it. If that's you, talk about it. Talk with us. Let's chat. God's doing something, and it's important. Because Romans 8, 9 says, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Meaning he's still in the flesh. He's still in sin. Christ is not in him. And the condemnation sign still hangs over him. It's a death sentence. On the other hand, there are those with their mindset on the Spirit who are in the Spirit. Look at verse 9. Paul says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. So therefore the idea is you live in the Spirit and the Spirit lives in you. That sounds like Jesus' prayer in John 17, doesn't it? He prayed that his disciples would be in him and he would be in them just as the Father is in him and he is in the Father. Or it's like Jesus' command to abide, right? <clears throat> John 15, 4. He said, remain in me and I in you. It's unity. It's, it's relationship. It's something totally, totally different. And God has to do it. God has to do it. We remain in us. He remains in. We remain in him. He remains in us. And if that's not the case, then it says you're still condemned. Okay. I'm running a hair late, but the good news is we're going to now move off the beach. We're going to move up here to this high vantage point, okay? God is making the argument sin has no hold on the Christian because of what Jesus did, okay? So at this point in his letter, let's remember he's talking to Christians. That's why he didn't right there tell us how to get saved. He didn't make any comments about it. He made the assumption that any of those who are in Christ have had this happen. I want us to look from this high overlook how those little pebbles moving and how the section of Scripture we just read is going to impact the bigger picture. Okay, so first, here's the first observation I want us to see. Nobody ever started in the Spirit. Now, maybe you were saved really early, I mean, John the Baptist is a superstar because I think he was saved in the womb, jumping and worshiping. But maybe that probably wasn't most of us. Maybe you were saved late. Whenever the time frame of your salvation, when your eyes were open for the first time, you went from being in the flesh to being in the spirit. If you would turn with me, I'm going to have to read these quick. If you would go to Ephesians chapter 2, I want to look at verses 1 through 5. While you're making your way there, I'm just going to start reading. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the way of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children of wrath, as the others were also. But God, praise the Lord, but God, who was rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. But God made us alive in Christ. It would be helpful to remember from where you came. And it'd be more important to remember who brought you from there into salvation. 
and praise Him and give Him thanks. This should humble us. This should help us realize that those in the world that we look at and go, oh, what's the matter with you? You're not like me. Maybe they don't have eyes to see. So we should pray that God would open their eyes, right? And we should stand ready to proclaim the truth of God's grace when he does. They don't have to keep hitting the donkey. Maybe you're the donkey. Maybe when God opens their eyes, something will change. Be ready to show God's love. Next, let us remember that God saved you for a purpose. He saved you, if you're saved, to the praise of his glory. This is not my idea. This is God's. If you still have Ephesians open, please look over to verses, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Another big passage, but I want you to hear it. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. In him we have also received an inheritance because we are predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. Listen to verse 12. So that, why were we saved? So that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring Praise to his glory. In him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. You were saved to worship and glorify God. He didn't do it to glorify you. And this should cause us to make everything that we do an act of worship to the Lord, to praise His glory. And finally, finally we've got there. Hang in there. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know what it means now, don't you? It has power now. Doesn't it? Why is there no condemnation? Because of Jesus. Not only what he did, but what he is doing right now. What's Jesus doing right now? Paul's argument continues, and it's building, and it's building, and it gets to eventually Romans 8, uh, 31. I can't wait for us to get there in a few weeks. Jump there real fast. Paul asks the question, what then are we to say about these things? What of all this salvation? What of all this God's working for his glory? What are we supposed to do? And then look what it says. 8.31 asks the question, what then are we to say about these things? It says, if God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who could bring an accusation against God's elect? What a question. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more, even more than what he did, he has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. He's right next to the Father. I died for that one. I died for that one. That one's justified. Here's a blessing. Here's a thing. That one is not condemned, but useful and powerful and bringing God glory. Father, bless this one. Bless that one that you, Father, would be glorified. That one's saved. That one's saved. That one's mine. I died for that one. That's what Jesus is doing for you right now. So there's no condemnation because your sin declaration was laid on Christ and put to death on the cross. And there's no condemnation because right now, Jesus is continually reminding the Father, no condemnation for that one. 
No condemnation for that one. You know what this means? There is no way possible sin can have a hold on you unless you bind yourself to it. Unless you shackle yourself to it. The death sentence is gone. Jesus took it away. So stop trying to take it away yourself. There's not one there. And every time you do, you're just chaining yourself back to the sin. Jesus is interceding for you right now. And he died for you on the cross. And if you are in Christ, sin has no hold on you. None whatsoever. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you would send your son Jesus, thank you that you would die and intercede for us. Holy Spirit, thank you that you open our eyes and show us. Oh, God, in three persons, Holy Trinity, we praise you. And I would ask, Father, that you would continue to save many for your glory, continue to transform and sanctify us, that we would continue to be reminded of our justification of what you've done and what you're doing. Lord, I know most of us are shackled to the sin you already paid for. Break those chains. Those are just chains of our own mindset. Remind us every day, if necessary, every hour, every minute, there is no condemnation for those who are in you. And God, I pray that you would be in us and us in you and you would grow that relationship so profoundly that we would know beyond any doubt that we are free in you because you submitted yourself to the law our sin in your hand. Thank you, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.